Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Peter Knox. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And with your spirit. The Church today celebrates the feast of the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. He is more easily known as Christ the King. And today we'll reflect on the various kings that we might have experienced, or the various governors we might have experienced and we see how Jesus is quite different to them and yet similar to them. We sometimes have very ambivalent reactions to authority in our lives. We sometimes reject people who are trying to help us for our own good. At the beginning of Mass, let's just spend a moment thinking of how we react to what our attitudes are towards our temporal leaders and ask that we might have a more appreciative attitude of their role. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We praise God together as we say, Glory Lord, to God, God in the in highest, and, and on earth peace, peace to people of goodwill. Will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, you take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of the universe. Grant, we pray, that the whole creation, set free from slavery, may render your majesty service and ceaselessly proclaim your praise. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the cloud of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord is king, with majesty enrobed. The Lord, the Lord is king, king with, with majesty, majesty enrobed. enrobed. The Lord is king, with majesty enrobed. The Lord has robed himself with might. He has girded himself with power. The Lord, the Lord is, is king. king with majesty enrobed. The world you made firm, not to be moved. Your throne has stood firm from old. From all eternity, O Lord, you are. The Lord, the Lord is, is king, king with, with majesty, majesty enrobed. Truly your decrees are to be trusted. Holiness is fitting to your house. 
O Lord, until the end of time. The Lord, the Lord is, is King, King with, with majesty, majesty in robes. A reading from the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, every one who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Pilate said to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not of this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we think of Jesus under a particular title, it's because we've got experience of that title already. So when I think of Jesus as Christ the King or the King of the universe, my mind has to go to kings that I know already, kings that I, I don't know any in person, but kings whom I read about. And recently in the news in South Africa, we've read about a number of kings, and I'll mention them as we go along. But let's begin first with King Shaka, the founder of the Zulu nation. He was a great and ruthless warrior. He killed thousands of his own soldiers. He waged wars on neighboring clans and tribes, and he built up the Zulu empire. We think of his successor, his most recent successor, King Zuelitini, Goodwill Zuelitini. He was largely powerless and ceremonial, and yet he was a great force for stability in the Zulu nation. At a crucial moment, he chose national rather than tribal allegiance. He put his weight behind the African National Congress rather than behind the Inkata Freedom Party. And we know after his death that there is still infighting for who's going to be his successor. Just this week, we read about King Dalindiebo, who received a 1 million, 1.8 million rand Mercedes-Benz SUV from Julius Malema, the leader of the EFF, the Economic Freedom Front. Why? Because he encouraged his tribe, the Amatembu, to vote for the EFF. That's a man of some influence. 
We think of King Moshweshwe, the founder of the Sutu nation, who brought his people high into the Maluti mountains to escape the Difatkane, the tribal wars of the 18th century. Moshweshwe was a skillful diplomat and a man of peace. His successor, King Letsie III of the Basutu, he couldn't even stop an attempted military coup, but he commands great loyalty among the Basutu, even outside of Lesotho, among the Basutu of, Southern, of South Africa. We think of King Sobuza, the founder of the Swazi nation. He is held in such reverence that his head is still on the Malangeni coins, the national coin of Eswatini, his head is still there. When we think of his successor, King Mswati III, he's the absolute monarch of Eswatini. He's getting fat while his people die of hunger. There's, at the moment, there's great protest against his rule, his autocratic style of doing things. He's suppressing this protest violently. Traditionally, he has the choice of maidens who perform at the annual reed dance. So far, he has about 13 wives, I believe. That means he's depriving 12 other Swazi men of potential wives. But he's an important symbol for the Swazi, for the Bas Amaswazi, a symbol of the value of fertility. We think of Seretsekama, who was one of the kings, a very, very early king of the, of the Botswana. But he gave up his royal title to marry his bride, Ruth. The South African government of the time, the 1940s, didn't want a black and white royal right on their border. So the South African government pressurized Britain to make the independent Botswana into a republic and not a kingdom. So Sarete Kama was not the king, but he was the president of independent Botswana. We think of another king, Edward VII, also a great lover. He abdicated his throne in the 1930s in the United Kingdom because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, a divorcee. And for a king to marry a divorcee wasn't acceptable in the 1930s. We think of the opposite extreme, King Henry VIII, who had six successive wives. He caused the Church of England to split from the Roman Catholic Church because he wouldn't accept the teaching of the Church on annulment. Again, on the other hand, we think of King Baudouin of, of, of Belgium, who kept the Walloons and the Flemish together through all sorts of political differences. He kept Belgium united. He was much loved. He was a moral man. He was a devout and charismatic Catholic. He refused to sign law permitting abortion in Belgium. He was very, very committed to Catholic values. So when Parliament wanted to sign that law, King Baudouin abdicated for a day so that Parliament had to sign it and he wouldn't. We think of King Rama the Ninth, the King of Thailand, 86 years old, frail. We saw pictures of him last year opening Parliament. At the time, he was the world's longest serving head of state, 68 years. Now his son has taken over from him, living in luxury in Germany, and there are protests for his son's resignation. We think of Queen Elizabeth II, who wasn't able to attend the Memorial Day uh, ceremony at the Cenotaph this year. For the first time in 23 years, she had sprained her back. She's intelligent, she's informed, she's well-read. She's had 13 British prime ministers serving under her, as well as over 100 prime ministers of Commonwealth countries. And then... Recently, there's been a spate of kings and queens of England who've been abdicating in favor of their heirs. And the first papal monarch, Benedict XVI, abdicated as well. I would say that's probably, when the history books are written, that's probably the most significant thing that Pope Benedict XVI did was to resign. 
he opened up for us a new understanding of what it is to be the Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, St. Peter. His resignation telling us that the papacy is not necessarily a lifelong um, ministry. And then finally, I think of Simba, of the Lion King. I think of him singing, I just can't wait, and it's a long, long wait to be king. I'm sure you all remember Simba wanting to get his hands or his paws on the monarchy. I think of poor Prince Charles. He's been waiting to be king for so long. Simba. There are so many incentives. There's so many reasons why people want to have power and authority. Political and business leaders are often attracted to the smart houses, the public platforms, the flashy cars, the trips overseas, the six-digit salaries, the opulence. And of course, there's no reason not to find these attractive. By and large, they can be good things if they are used correctly. However, it's tempting to seek the privilege of authority, but to try to avoid the responsibility that goes with that authority. The more we receive, the more is expected of us, Jesus tells us. A mature leader is one who uses the accoutrements of office in order to fulfill the task at hand. Like Simba, on the other hand, an infantile leader doesn't know how to use these for the benefit of his or her constituency. True leaders, undeterred, carry much of the responsibility but receive very little glory. And you might ask yourself, what has this all got to do with Jesus? Well, today's celebration, the solemnity, is not just about a form of government whether it's monarchy or republic, which is better than which. In fact, Jesus is very clear. He says it three times in today's gospel. My kingship is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not like all those kings that Peter has just listed for us. Christ the king, whom we celebrate today, took on the responsibility of saving the world, and his crown was a crown of thorns. This is often the lot of a true leader, to be wearing a crown of thorns. The Catholic Church has used this feast to support monarchies in various, in various situations, but it only became a liturgical feast. It only came into the liturgical calendar in 1925. It was instituted by Pope Pius XI in response to growing nationalism and secularism in Europe. It hasn't always been a liturgical feast. In today's readings, we heard the prophecy of Daniel about the coming of the king with an everlasting dominion. Centuries before Jesus was born, the Jewish people were already waiting for this eternal king. He is robed in majesty, might, and power, as we hear in the psalm. The only model that psalmists can think of is a magisterial king, a mighty king, a powerful king. But Jesus is different to that. He's not like the earthly kings. In the book of Revelation, John confirms the prophecy that Daniel had made so many hundreds of years earlier. And he takes it further. Every eye shall see him. Every eye, every single person, Christ is a universal king, shall see him. And those who remain faithful, he will free us from our sins and make us into an eternal kingdom. And in John's gospel today, Jesus tells us that the king is going to be one who suffers, who's handed over to the Jews. In his book of the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius of Loyola presents us with the image of an earthly king and a heavenly king. And St. Ignatius has us meditate with what loyalty we would follow the heavenly king, the eternal king. We would endure with our king, Christ, all abuse, all poverty, all injuries, if he chooses this state of life for us, his co-workers. So we take a composite picture of all the kings we know, we take the picture of majesty, we take the image 
of fidelity. We take the image of knowledge. We take the image of of uh, fecundity, that is, um, great fruitfulness. We take all these bits and pieces from the kings that we know about, and we apply them to Jesus, and we take just the good bits. We don't take all the other bits and pieces of the lives of these kings and queens. We apply them to Jesus to try to understand what the eternal king is like, what Jesus' kingship is like. We look around at the examples of the good monarchs, and we try to find out what this feast is telling us about Jesus. We think of his wisdom. We think of his duty, his dedication to duty. We think of his absolute authority in our lives. Monarch means one mono leader, one ruler. We can't serve in our lives both God and money, for example. We can have one leader. Our allegiance is to God alone. And as Pope Pius XI said, not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. He should reign in our minds, our wills, our hearts, our bodies, if we are to say he is king. We should think about the leader who commands universal devotion, the leader who receives authority directly from God, the leader who, like Moshweshwe, creates and leads a new people, a leader who, like Zuelitini, doesn't impose himself, but allows people to exercise their dignity of choosing, the leader who represents fertility and life, and yet doesn't hoard it all for himself, the leader who has a deep history, 86 years of monarchy, is with us for our whole lives, and is not here today and gone tomorrow, a king represents stability and continuity, tradition, if that's helpful. Presidents, mayors, members of parliament, members of, of provincial governments, they come and they go. We might change families, we might change countries or cities, but only Christ remains constant for all of us. Now, obviously, you have your own ideas of an ideal leader. From kings, perhaps, in your part of the world, or of your ethnic group. We project all of these good ideals onto Christ, and we cannot stop praising God for giving us a Lord like him. But only Christ has all the virtues that we hope to find in our ideal leader. Let us stand now and make our profession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we bring our prayers before the Lord, we remember today all of our leaders, all of our servants.
We pray for our political leaders. Guide them, Lord, to serve and not to seek to be served. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all our healthcare professionals. In times of great pressure, may they find their strength and perseverance in you, Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for our new metropolitan and town councils. Lord, let them learn the skills to bring the services to people all around our country. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the poor, whose dignity is crushed and whose lives are insecure. Inspire us, Lord, to care for them as our own brothers and sisters. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for Pope Francis, who will lead our church into a new year. Grant him the wisdom and patience he needs as shepherd of your flock. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And we pray for all our own needs. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord God of our ancestors, we ask you to hear us and these prayers which we bring to you, those prayers which remain deep in our hearts. We ask that you grant us whatever we need according to your will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. For through your goodness we receive this bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. This is God for you. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for I will be good for God's holy church. Lord, as we offer you the sacrifice by which the human race is reconciled to you, we humbly pray that your Son himself may bestow on all nations the gifts of unity and peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them out to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It's truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you anointed your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the oil of gladness, as eternal priest and king of all creation, so that by offering himself on the altar of the cross as spotless sacrifice to bring us peace, he might accomplish these mysteries of human redemption. 
and making all created things subject to his rule, he might present the immensity of your majesty, an eternal and universal kingdom, a kingdom of truth and life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love and peace. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. This is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew fall, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, broke it, and gave the bread to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. We proclaim the mystery of faith when we eat this bread and drink this cup. We proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope, with Booty our Bishop, with all the clergy and with all the lay people who serve in your church. Remember our brothers and sisters who've fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who've died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At the Saviour's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We pray to Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, 
who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to share in the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and the blood of Christ keep us safe for eternal life. Amen. Amen. Although you cannot receive physical communion with us now, we invite you into a moment of spiritual communion. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, defined spiritual communion as an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Sacrament and a loving embrace as though we had already received him. His words are echoed by the great mystic and fellow doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, When you do not receive communion and do not attend Mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. At this moment, we invite you to focus on Christ and your longing for union with Him. Express your desire to feel His grace coursing through you, giving you strength and courage, particularly in these difficult times. In your desiring union, you are united with us and to Christ. In this moment, we experience the reality that is already here. Let us pray. Lord, we have received the food of immortality. Grant that, glorifying in obedience to the commands of Christ, the King of the universe, we may live with him eternally in his heavenly kingdom, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in peace and joy to love and to serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God.